I am so excited today to um, introduce to you a very special guest that we have to speak to you today. Um, it is our pleasure to introduce to you Valerie M. Hudson. Uh, she is a professor of pol political science here at Brigham Young University. She received her doctorate in political science from Ohio State University in 1983 and taught previously at Northwestern and Reuters Universities. Hudson served as director of graduate studies in the David M. Kennedy Center for International and Area Studies for eight years. Her specialties include national security affairs, foreign policy analysis, and gender and international relations. Um, she's the author of numerous articles and volumes, and her latest book is Bear Branches, Security Implications of Asia's Surplus Male Population, which is published by MIT Press. Uh, her newest project involves understanding how the status of women affects the security and attributes of nation states. And once again, we'd like to give a warm welcome to Professor Valerie Hudson. Okay, I understand that you're the Security Council. You look a lot happier than most pictures taken of the Security Council, so uh, that's good. Maybe it's good for the world, who knows. Uh, today I'm here to talk to you about the nuclear nonproliferation regime uh, with special emphasis on the role of the IAEA as well as the South Asian nuclear situation, specifically the fact that both Pakistan and India have um, nuclear weapons. I think we need to back up a little bit and talk about some history first, and then we'll bring us up to the present. Nuclear nonproliferation is one of the most pressing issues facing the Security Council. And what I would like to presage my conclusion uh, by saying is that um, sure looks like that regime is going to go belly up. All right. Right, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, or otherwise known as the NPT, goes all the way back to 1968. Um, and the, the, oftentimes we think the treaty was just against the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Well, that was a big part of it, but it was not the whole picture. So let's explain the whole picture and how that figures into today's debate. The treaty divided um, the nations of the world into two groups, nuclear-possessing states and non-nuclear-possessing states. Okay? And you were categorized according to what your status was when you signed the treaty in 1968. Now, just signing the treaty automatically placed you in a category with certain obligations. And so there were some countries that refused to sign the treaty because they did not want to be stuck in a particular category. Now, nobody who was a nuclear-possessing state was afraid to be stuck in that category, okay? The ones who were afraid to be stuck were the ones in the second category, non-nuclear-possessing states. And so there were nations such as India and so forth who were going after nuclear weapons and were not willing... Okay, to be stuck in that category um, because they, they knew their own mind. Um, we often um, speak of the NPT as a treaty that prohibited non-nuclear possessing states from getting nuclear weapons. Okay, and that's true. That's a very big part of it. But there were several things that the nuclear possessing states put on the table. Okay, one was 
the goal of global disarmament, you know, that one day the nuclear-possessing states would all agree to give up their nuclear weapons. Second, sharing of peaceful nuclear technology with non-nuclear-possessing states, okay? This meaning reactors and so forth for energy production. And fourth, no technology transfer to non-nuclear-possessing states, okay? Um, it's important to keep that in mind as we talk about situations such as Iran. But let's go ahead and, and uh, go forward. So we had quite a few nations that did not sign the, uh, as non-nuclear possessing states, and that meant that even from its conception, there were some severe flaws in this um, nuclear non-proliferation regime. It was tacitly assumed that there were some nations who were just going to get nuclear weapons no matter what. I wonder if you could name me some nations that have acquired nuclear weapons since 1968. Yeah. North Korea. Okay, North Korea. Oh, where did we put that? Who else? Yes? Israel. Israel. Sir? India. India? 74? Yes. Pakistan. Pakistan, 98. Yes, sir? Yes. We'll put it in parentheses because South Africa no longer has a nuclear weapons program, but yes, South Africa did have a nuclear weapons program. It's unsure whether they had any nuclear weapons. Yes. Japan will put in parentheses as well because... Japan is an interesting case. Um, it has a peace constitution, all that other good stuff, and yet it also spends, I think, the second or third largest amount of money on their self-defense forces per year. Um, one of their former prime ministers um, went on record as saying that if they wanted nuclear weapons, they could have them within four months. So... <laughs> Yeah, that, that's one of those cases, parenthetical cases. Yes? They had a program. They never had any weapons, but they had a program. So let's see. This one could have a program. This one gave up its program. Libya gave up its program. Any other coulds or gave ups? Let's see, young lady. Sure. Iran, Iran is could plus, right? <laughs> As in, you know, the CIA is now making estimates about how many months it will take for them to have their first nuclear warheads. Sir? Uh, did China get its weapons after or before? Before, yeah. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Did. Not any longer. Anyone else? Well, there's actually, you know, there's, there's at least a few others. There's some gave ups in South America. Brazil and Argentina were gave ups. And there is another one that is a could. And that's Taiwan. Okay, which would obviously complicate any future conflict scenario between the People's Republic of China and Taiwan if Taiwan had nuclear weapons. All right. Um, uh, the United States did have a very vigorous program for sharing peaceful nuclear technology. It even had a name. It was called Atoms for Peace was actually first initiated under the Eisenhower administration, which so it predates the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And um, unfortunately, it was the Atoms for Peace program that allowed for proliferation to certain countries, specifically India. India took early advantage of the Atoms for Peace program before 1968, and it did gain enough technology so that its scientists could take it further. And its scientists did, in fact, create nuclear weapons from the, the, the foundation of technology that was given to them by the United States. 
Um, we also helped out some other countries. Sometimes we didn't know we were helping them out. Um, Israel reportedly got its um, first um, special nuclear material, which is the highly enriched uranium, plutonium, by stealing it from U.S. labs. So there was another interesting tie-in there. Uh, and then, of course, the ties proliferate. For example, Israel and South Africa were cooperating on the development of nuclear weapons at one point. And uh, Pakistan uh, was uh, in cahoots with the North Koreans, and uh, Pakistan was, uh, was also um, selling its know-how and wares to Libya and to Iran. Okay. So it's, a, it's kind of a checkered picture. Where does the IAEA fall into all of this? The IAEA is the International Atomic Energy Agency. And as some of you may know, it is supposed to be the verification and enforcement mechanism for the NPT. Uh, the IAEA um, has a different set of regulations depending upon whether you're a nuclear-possessing state or a non-nuclear-possessing state. Once you've, um, you have acceded to the treaty and the treaty's been ratified, they will set up a number of mechanisms to try and make sure that you're not violating the treaty. Let's talk about them from the point of view of the non-nuclear-possessing states. So if you declared yourself a non-nuclear possessing state, and let's suppose that you also had peaceful nuclear reactors, what they would do is they would first ask you for a complete inventory of all special nuclear material in your country. Okay? So you would have to present them an inventory of how many uh, kilograms of this, that, and the other you had. You would also have to declare to the IAEA what facilities in your country were doing R&D on um, anything nuclear or facilities that were devoted to uh, peaceful nuclear energy. All of those facilities would have to be declared. The IAEA would then go in and um, it would verify what you had told them. They would also put in place uh, cameras and other types of sensory equipment to monitor what was going on at these facilities. Uh, remember several years ago, um, uh, they had um, a system of video cameras that would turn on randomly um, three or four times an hour for a couple of minutes at a, at a time. And so then eventually the inspectors would come back, they would take the tape, and they would see what had been happening uh, over the months that they had left the tape uh, there. Um, there's also, um, they would also inspect to make sure that you had uh, control over your special nuclear material. They have standards for, for that kind of control. And so that's how the IAEA conducts its business. Under the IAEA, any party to the treaty can challenge another nation and say, we think they are breaking the treaty at which point the IAEA is supposed to conduct a challenge inspection. The only problem is, I believe, the last time I looked at the treaty, it was like 72 hours. There could be up to a 72-hour lag between the time the IAEA announced that it would do a challenge inspection and the time when the inspectors actually had to be led into the country. So even there, there's some loopholes going on. Now, for many years, despite India going nuclear in the 70s, people thought the nuclear nonproliferation regime was a, was a smashing success, smashing success, that it showed that the nations of the world could come together, they could cooperate, and they could reduce the threat, um, a, a real threat to the world system. Well, that's breaking down, okay? It's breaking down. And actually, one of the reasons it's breaking down is that the Cold War ended. Right? The Cold War once provided for secure nuclear umbrellas. Okay. Tell me, under, uh, which countries were under the U.S.'s nuclear umbrella? Which countries could count on 
the United States to respond to a nuclear attack on their homeland by nuclear weapons. Mm-hmm. That's right. All the NATO countries, right? Yes. Yeah. That never really came up as an issue, but you're right. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. Israel? No. No, not specifically. That's why the Israelis went ahead and developed their own. There was no specific pledge. Anyone else? Japan? Okay. Yeah. Mm-mm. Not during not during the Cold War. Mm-mm. Okay. Yes, ma'am. That was always left unsaid. It was left unsaid, but there was still the feeling that yes, the U.S. would use nuclear weapons if China invaded Taiwan. You know, it was couched in diplomatic language like the U.S. is prepared to use all means at its disposal to. You know, uh, another thing under the U.S. nuclear umbrella was um, the Persian Gulf. Now, not the Persian Gulf nations. Interestingly, what was under the U.S. nuclear umbrella during the Cold War was um, the oil fields. So that if the oil fields were destroyed by any hostile party, that the U.S. was prepared to respond with nuclear weapons. That was kind of interesting. Who was under the Soviets' nuclear umbrella? Yes. Yeah, Warsaw Pact countries. Was China under their nuclear umbrella? No, right? At some point, the yeah. In the late 60s, relations between China and the Soviet Union, it was even before then it was, it was sour, but the West realized it was for real in the late 60s, and that's why the Chinese developed their own nuclear weapons, right? We, did you want to add something? No? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> and so I understand some of you are involved in a simulation there. Yes, Cuba was under the, the Soviet nuclear umbrella. All right. Now, when those umbrellas went away, right, with the end of the Cold War, I think that's when quite a number of nations began to reassess the geostrategic situation and to say to themselves, it's in our best interest to develop nuclear weapons. And furthermore, we no longer have a strong patron who could A, protect us, or B, stop us. Okay? Those strong patrons were gone. And the, the first um, to kind of openly talk about their nuclear ambitions was Pakistan. One of the former prime ministers of Pakistan said, Pakistanis will eat grass if they have to, to sacrifice to get the first Islamic bomb. And they did. Okay, they did. Absolutely. Um, I think the development of nuclear weapons by North Korea is also a sign that their patron, the Soviet Union, was no longer strong enough to rein them in. When, um, when North Korea lost the patronage of the Soviet Union, they lost a great deal. Because even though we might think of the North Korean regime and the communist regime and the People's Republic of China as being natural allies, for many historical reasons, they actually are not that close allies. Okay? It is true that North Korea is heavily dependent upon China for um, imports of coal and other types of energy-related resources. But it's also true that the two regimes do not see eye to eye and that North Korea was much closer to the Soviet Union than it was to China throughout its history as a communist country. Okay? Uh, situated where they were uh, with that constellation, of positive and negative relationships, it's absolutely no wonder that the North Koreans developed nuclear weapons. Okay, it was their ace in the hole. Right now there are six-party talks going on to try to get the North Koreans to give up their nuclear weapons. How many of you think that the probability of that happening is greater than zero? Good. Very good. That is correct. Okay, North Korea is nothing without its nuclear weapons, and North Korea would view itself as very, very vulnerable without nuclear weapons. So they're going to keep them. So there's just no doubt about it. Uh, Japan, 
Um, here's, an, here's a little domino here, right? If uh, North Korea, okay, becomes really cocky about its nuclear weapons, and so you could say they've already kind of become really cocky about their nuclear weapons, you will see Japan change over time to the point where it would develop a small nuclear arsenal. Okay? I think that will happen. We've already seen movement towards a more pro-military regime with the election of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Um, Taiwan. Taiwan has still been betting on the U.S. But I think more and more as time goes on, the, the people of Taiwan are believing that that's not a really good bet. It was a super good bet in the 50s. It was still a pretty good bet in the 60s. Still a pretty good bet in the 70s. Not so good a bet in the 80s, 90s, and now. In my large intro to IR class, I often pose the scenario. If the Chinese invaded Taiwan, how many of you would support a draft to create an army in the U.S. large enough to launch a counter-invasion of Taiwan? How many of you would be willing to be drafted to go try to invade Taiwan once the Chinese had conquered it. Because it's going to be after the fact. Trust me on this. Any of you? I think public opinion in the U.S. is really fading as far as its you know, support for vigorous military defense of Taiwan. And let's talk about Iran. Um, the Iranians are going to get nuclear weapons. They have the means. They have the riches. And they feel like they have the need. Okay? First of all, you may know that the regime in Iran is implacably opposed to Israel and has often complained about the double standard. Israel has nuclear weapons. Nobody else has nuclear weapons. Right? Now, why aren't they just happy with the Islamic bomb of the Pakistanis? Yes? Right. And they're also different ethnically, right? The Iranians are Persians. So this will be the Persian Shia bomb <laughs> as versus what the bomb in Pakistan is. Okay? And that, they believe that that will give them incredible power within the Middle Eastern regions. Here's another domino that's ready to fall. The Gulf Cooperation Council, which consists of those oil-rich but people and resource, other resource-poor nations of the Persian Gulf, have stated that if Iran develops a nuclear arsenal, so will they. Oh, that sounds like fun, doesn't it? Let's have nuclear weapons throughout the entire Middle East. Great. <laughs> India and Pakistan deserve a special word. Oh, and that word is oh boy. Um, the Indian-Pakistani relationship, as you know, has been extremely hostile over the over the years, since independence in 1947 from Britain. They have fought wars, several wars. And uh, even though now it appears that tensions are cooling between India and Pakistan, we've seen that before. We've seen a couple of years of, 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 of better relations, and then it has gone back to conflict. Military experts tell us that even if there was a small nuclear exchange between the two countries, that you'd be looking at a best-case scenario, or how about least worst-case scenario, of about 20 million deaths. 20 million people would die, even in a, in a, in a, a short exchange between the two countries. Most military experts believe that that's where the first nuclear war will be, between India and Pakistan. Um, military experts do tend to be somewhat optimistic. I, I think that optimism in the face of 20 million dead is kind of like whistling past the graveyard. But they state that in the, in the wake of such carnage, many nations that could have nuclear weapons would reassess that and that there would be a growing demand uh, by nations for some kind of stronger non-proliferation regime or even counter-proliferation regime. 
Right now, the non-proliferation regime that we have, as I said, is going belly up. Which each, with each new rogue state that declares its nuclear weapons arsenal, other non-rogue states in reaction have to develop their own nuclear arsenals. One political science theorist believes that one day nearly every country will have nuclear weapons simply to stand off every other country that has nuclear weapons. This particular theorist also argues that will be a much more stable world. But frankly, I'm not sure I would want to see it. I'm not sure I would want to live in it. What's the alternative? Well, that's up to the Security Council, right? So good luck.